you've probably never heard of him, but this guy is one of the foremost leaders in my field. You see, I'm a teacher librarian, and S.R. Ranganathan is considered the father of library science of India. Now, I'm not Indian, but his five laws of library science are as relevant today as they were when he first articulated them back in 1931. And I'm Christine Sturgeon, thank you very much, and let's rethink the library considering Rangathan's five laws. Listen, there we go, I get it. Libraries, aren't they a little old fashioned? And librarians, they're like these women who shush you all the time if you're being loud and they, they have their hair in a bun and they wear cardigan sweaters and reading glasses, right? <laughs> all right, you know, okay. I may resemble that remark, although I want it on record. First, men can be librarians. And second, I don't like to shush. It's just that sometimes it is absolutely necessary. So the thing is, in all seriousness, you know, libraries are much more than what you imagine. If you haven't been in a library in a long time, you're really missing out. We are much more than books. And librarians, we are much more than our stereotype. So back to Ranganathan. He was a mathematician turned librarian. And the funny thing is, is he hated his job. He loved being a math professor. And then when he became a librarian, he was just so shocked at how quiet and this life of solitude that he had, he had found himself in. And he didn't know what to do. So he ended up going overseas to get some training. And he came back with a newfound vision of what libraries should be. He really saw, he, he sought for his library to be the intellectual and cultural center of not only his university, but also his city. He was really a man ahead of his time. Now, with that said, he was also a man of his time. He, you know, he traveled by steamship and he corresponded with Melville Dewey, the other father of library science. And you will notice in his language with his five laws that some of them are a little antiquated and they needed a little sprucing up for the century. So I took the liberty of doing that. So the first law is this, books are for use. Okay, simple enough, but like I said, libraries are more than just about books, right? So let's change that. Library resources are for use. You know, don't get me wrong, I love books. I love a nice, strong print collection. I love preschool story time. I mean, seriously, is there anything better in the world than preschool story time? I challenge you to find it. And the thing is, though, libraries are, again, much more than that. There are libraries in Iowa that have collections that they circulate to their patrons of vegetable seeds and laptop computers and puppets and over 300 cake pans for um, you know, decorating your kid's birthday cake. And so we are a lot more than just that. Now, in my own library, we have a thousand books before kindergarten program. And so little people come in and they check out backpacks full of 10 preschool level books for someone to read to them at home. So yes, library resources are for use. Sometimes those are books and except when it's not. So the second law is this. Every reader, his book. Well, yeah, yeah, we already went over that it's not always about books, so that's an easy change. Every patron, their library resource. And so what this means is that if you come into the library, you should be able to find what you're looking for, right? So at my high school, the science teachers want their, their high school kids to read a literary nonfiction book about a science topic over the trimester. So I've built up that collection. So we have everything from, you know, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring to Twinkie Demystified, The World Without Us, and The Physics of Star Trek. Now, the PE teacher at that school, he wanted to better communicate with a student who used American Sign Language. And so I asked a friend of mine who is deaf, and he suggested that I get these cards. And so they are in my library and they are available for checkout. So again, you know, things, library resources aren't just books. Now, this is my daughter, Abby. Like really, 
big. She doesn't know I'm doing that, so she's not going to be too happy when she sees this video. Sorry, Abby. And she was in a class that she read a book of her own choosing. And then she did a project about the book. And so she read World War Z, the zombie book, and she wanted to create a puppet show. And so that was great. You know, she's red-blooded American teenagers. She goes on YouTube and she finds she finds a video on how to do that because she doesn't want to just make any puppets. She wants to make Muppets. And so we go to the fabric store and $80 later, we come back and she's home and she's ready to go. And this is important. I want you to understand that I am a woman with a sewing machine, okay? We're clear on that. But I'm also a woman who didn't know where her power cord was. So what is Abby going to do? She ends up, she goes to the family and consumer science teacher at our school and she hooks her right up and that's great. But what if Abby rode the bus and wasn't able to stay before or after school? What if Abby and this teacher did not get along? What if, you know, this teacher was very territorial about her equipment because she'd been burned by students before? What if instead we had a place in the school where someone could go and use a sewing machine? or someone could go and use a 3D printer, or decorative scissors, or glitter, right? So let's have a place in the school where tools and resources are available for student use, that they can come and use them, they don't have to have an appointment, they don't have to have permission, that they can come and use that. And those places exist, and they are called maker spaces. I have one at my elementary school, and then another at my secondary school. And libraries across the country are increasingly putting them into their spaces for their communities. And I believe that this is really changing the very foundation of my field, and I think it's doing so in a very positive way. And so the third, book, third law, I'm sorry, is every book its reader. And so again, you know, it's not all about books, right? And so it's every library resource its patron. Move over so you can see that. Um, so this simply means that we, you know, we don't like to waste money. We want to buy things that people are going to use. So that, you know, you may ask for an item and I'll try to get it. And I also buy things that I think people will want to use, but it's really on me to make sure that they know about that. It's bulletin boards, it's book talks, it's makerspace nights where we use a, a new tool. Because, you know, it's no fault of the patron if they don't use our resources if they don't know that the resources exist. So that, that's a pretty simple law. So then the fourth law is save the time of the reader. And so we'll change this, of course, to save the time of the library patron. And one way that I do that is by how I organize my books. And so I use what's called the bookstore model. And so in fiction, instead of books being alphabetized A to Z, uh, you know, by author's last name, it is done by genre. So I have fantasy books and I have, you know, romance books and I have science fiction books. And those books, you know, then, then those are done alphabetically by author within the subject, so or within the genre, it's very easy to find. And so when, my, when I have a class of fifth graders come in and say, Mrs. Sturgeon, we all need to have a mystery book, instead of me racking my brains and trying to remember, you know, who the author of Encyclopedia Brown is, come on, it's Donald Sobel, that was an easy one, then we, you know, I just point them to the mystery book and they can help themselves. In the nonfiction then, I use, instead of using Dewey Decimal, sorry Melville, I have switched to what's called the Bistic model. And that is how bookstores organize their books. And so, you know, I have agriculture and I have philosophy and I have travel. And then those subjects are done in alphabetical order. And so frankly, I think it's a lot easier to find books in my library than it is at the bookstore. And finally, law five. Now this one, the library is a growing organism, actually needs no change at all. And it's really why I think Ranginathan is brilliant. That, that 85 years ago, he understood that libraries would change. They would not stay the same. That libraries and librarians that we, who in order to stay relevant, and important in our communities, we have, to, we have to also change and adapt. And so, if you haven't been to the library in a long time, I would urge you to come in and check us out. Thank you.